Ceremonia Nudan stand more deeply the significant comes with the Omer. You should look at the prayers. If you turn to page 149, it's Philip Colpair. Can you all turn to please pass it on? So, um, here at the bottom of the page is a short prayer many people say before counting the Omer when they quote the verse from the book of Ayikra, Pashad Emon, chapter 23, where it says, You should count for yourselves from the morrow of the Shabbat, from the day when you bring the Omer HaTnufa, the Omer which is waved upwards. Sheva Shabbatot Motiel, there should be seven complete Shabbatot, Ad Morat Shabbat Shabbat until the morrow of the seventh Shabbat, you should count fifty days. It is Bru Hamishim Yom, Bikratem in Chachadash Hashem, and with the fiftieth day, you bring a new offering to Hashem. And as we've already discussed, and I'm sure all of you know, that the Omer was a small tenth of an eighth of a small amount of barley flour. And then on Shavuot, in the sanctuary, in the Hamikdash, they brought the Omer on the day after Pesach, the night after Pesach, perhaps the day after Pesach. And then the uh, two loaves of bread were brought on Shavuot. And they were specifically loaves of bread to the Chomit. <coughs> and then we count the Omer. So our custom, let's see, our custom of the Ashkenazim is to count it. One, two, one, from the first day, let's go to, to um, today's date. This date is the um, 24th of Iyar. So that's Tisha Ushroshim Yom. We say it's 39 days. Shem Chamisha Shavor, Rabbi Meba Om. It's on page 153. But amongst uh, very many of the Sephardi ways of counting it, they count it somewhat differently. Ayom, Shmonao, Shlashim, Leomer. Not the same as yours. I brought quite a lot up here. 153 is Bikap Tamazon. Ma 153 is Bikap Tamazon. Okay. There's no more there? I brought up quite a few. So it's, it's Ayom. So you can't find it at Sfira Taome. Okay, well, find a different page. I'll find the page. It's after Marib. Yeah. It's yeah. after Marib. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. So it's, um, they first count the days La Ome. Tisha Mishroshim La Ome. Sheheim Hamisha Shvot Vabayim Baro. Vepalim Shamisha Shvot Vabayim Baro. This is also the, the Yemenite way and many Safadi Tehillot counted in that manner. So I want to explain this is quite significant. First of all, there's a statement made in the Gemara by uh, Bayer, also in fact it's also in the prices somewhere else, that it's a mitzvah to count the days, mitzvah to count the weeks. And then we have, we have a basic difference of opinion. There's the opinion of Tosfot, and apparently also Rashi, and it's also decided at the court of the Rosh, that today we have no Omer, we have no uh, Beit HaMikdash, as a result of which we don't really have a mitzvah of the Torah to count the Omer. 
And according to this view, you will see that after the counting of the Omer, in fact, it's not brought so much in these Sidurim, but you'll find that in nearly all the Sidurim of the strict Ashkenazim, he has also brought here briefly. And this is brought on page 150. And you'll find it immediately after the whole, the, the first day of the Omer, the Bracha, the first day, you will say, especially when May Hashem bring us back the service of the Beit HaMikdash. And the emphasis on this prayer is following the view that today we learn of Beit HaMikdash, therefore counting of the Omer is not Minat Torah, it's just Zeichel HaMikdash. And this has halachic uh, ramifications because, simply speaking, the the the, the Shulchan Aruch seems to follow this view that it is the Rabbanan today, and because we don't have we do, the Om isn't brought today, the Om is an offering, it can't bring offerings. We have no Beit Hamikdash, so we look forward time to new when we can count Minat Torah. We have the opposing view of the Rambam, who clearly says it's a mitzvah of the Torah, today also. And the Rambam in the Sefer Mitzvot, we describe the mitzvot, he says, it's also when it says there are two mitzvot, one mitzvah is counting the days and the other one is counting the weeks, there are two parts of one mitzvah. Although, the, the, the source for there being two different mitzvahs is taken from two different sections of the Chumash. The verse which we quoted before, it does mention the Omer, it mentions the new offering brought on Shavuot, but the emphasis is Yom, you've got to count up to 50 days. So it mentions the day counting explicitly. And then it says those days that you count have to include the Shabbat. It's got to be seven complete Shabbat thoughts which should be included. Now when the Bright and Abai, when they say it's a mitzvah to count the days, they quote the verse from the book of Vayikra, from Emo, 23rd chapter of Vayikra. But when they quote the mitzvah of the weeks, they quote the verse brought in Tvarim, in Parsha A, which we described yesterday at greater length, where it says, also a list of festivals, but does not include Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, only the three pilgrim festivals, and the central aspect of the calendar, as described in Sefer Tvarim, is in preparation for entering to Eretz Israel. And there it says, Me'achel Chermesh Pakti, Shiva Shavuot Tisbalok, there it's called Shavuot. And that is the origin of the name for the festival of Shavuot, which is not mentioned in Emor, it doesn't use the word Shavuot. It says, Sheva Shabbatot Simeotiena. It emphasizes Shabbatot, but not Shavuot. It might be, it was the same thing, isn't it? No, it's not the same, we'll analyze that soon. So there they bring the verse, concentrating upon the harvest of Eretz Israel, where the first of the harvest is the Omer, but doesn't use the word Omer, it's surprising. It's just that when the scythe begins to cut the standing grain, that's when you start counting the seven weeks, and in the conclusion of the seven weeks, you celebrate the Chag Shavuot, Hashem Lokecha, in Yerushalayim. <coughs> so it's like this. We explained yesterday, to go into it more deeply, and I bring together a lot of sources, and we see there's a deep teaching here. And the, the depth of the teaching is through a third halachic opinion, which some say is also really the basis of the opinion of the Rambam. Why the Rambam say it applies even today, when it's linked to the offerings in the temple, 
So why does he say it applies even when there's no temple? Because of the Omer, the counting of the days, which is mentioned, Miyom Aviachem, it doesn't say from when you actually bring it, from the day when you should be bringing it. And, if, and the, so Rabbi Yeruchem, who was one of the early, the early Rishonim, he says, to count the days is a mitzvah, one mitzvah, to count the weeks is a second mitzvah. In the time of the temple, it said two brachot. They had one bracha on counting the days and one bracha on counting the weeks. Mm-hmm. Counting the weeks you learn out from the varim where it doesn't mention the days at all. Mm-hmm. And counting the days we learn out from Emma where it seems to mention Chapatot. Also some people think it means the week. So according to the, the analysis which we made in the previous year, I want to put it as follows. It has to do with the definition of Omer. So do you remember, why should the barley grain offering, why is it called Omer? What, what does Omer really mean? Do any of you remember? Yeah, a bundle. Can you tell me what Omer mean? A bundle. Pardon? A bundle. A what? A bundle. A bundle. So what's got to do with a uh, with barley grain? It has to be bundled, brought bundled to the Bidami Pesh, not loose. But what is the Om? How is the Om defined in the Chumash? Measurement. The Om by Yamod, we went back to the first time the Om is mentioned. The man, in the man. The Om is not, it is not, the Om is not the bundle of grain. No. It's an amount of flour. It says, They measured the amount of mon that came down in the desert before there was a temple, yeah. before the giving of the Aserat Adibrot, yeah. before any other mention of Shabbat in the Torah except right in the first chapter. In the first chapter of Bereshit it says, he blessed the seventh day. It's not called the Shabbat there. It says, Kivo Shabbat, we call him Lachto. It doesn't mention the root Shabbat. It's a day when Hashem rests from his creation. And where do we find this in nature? We find it by the mon. By Vorech et Yom By Vorech Yom this is the blessing of the mon, which came on Erev Shabbat and none came on Shabbat. And that's the holiness of the, of the Mon. And the holiness of the Mon, which came from heaven, was that there was no Mon on Shabbat. In other words, we have to take the portion of physical life from Hashem, the six days. On the seventh day, we have to demonstrate, by not doing any creative work, that all creative work which we have from nature comes from Hashem's creation and not from the human being. And that's why from there we have the root that Shabbat is the source of the livelihood for the people of Israel when they're wandering in the desert and also when we're wandering through all the different trials of life. Now the Shabbat, this, 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 this is the first demonstration of the supernatural Shabbat, which overcame the laws of ordinary laws of nature. That this mon was there all the week, was not there on Shabbat. And to, re- to remember this, it's described in Pasha B'Shalach, shortly after the great miracle of the splitting of the sea. So there we have the long Pasha Tamon, and there it says the Omer three times. The Omer is a measure. What measure is it? It's the measure that a person requires for his sustenance, for each individual. So therefore it's a law for the individual. The individual Jew has to know he and his family are provided for by not only the Creator, but the one who has hashgacha, who has cotton providence over every human being and every member of Am Yisrael. And when we, whether we're wandering in the desert 
or wandering the desert of the nations, because wandering in the, in the desert is referred to in the prophet Yahu as being a premonition of wandering amongst all the nations of the world, being the wandering Jew, and knew the wandering Jew is also the wandering Jew. The fact that, we have, the, fact that the Jews are exiled all over the world and scattered everywhere and generally have to face great difficulties. Sometimes we have times of fortune, but unfortunately, frequently, too frequently, times of great misfortune in today all over the world and there are attacks upon Jews. So we're also wondering what's going on with it. We're the people of Hashem and we have to wander from place to place, but Hashem looks after us. And we have to know each individual will be able to reach happiness. We already explained the concept of Mon instead of the concept of Lechem. Lechem is Milchama, is the fighting struggle for survival. And Mon is to recognize that everything we have in the world is a portion given to us by Hashem. And a person is given his particular portion. And if he feels happy with this, he'll never have a lack of anything. Because he'll say, Hashem gives me everything. The mid of Yaakov Venus is actually called, I've got everything I need. And if he has more, it also rots away, unless he gives it away. So that's the, that, that's the lesson of the Omer. The lesson of the Omer is a deep lesson in recognizing Hashem as the one who looks after every individual. Now, to reach the, to reach the giving of the Torah, the people of Israel, even when they wandered in the desert, they had to count the days. Or they, they had the custom to count the days when they went out from Egypt until they reached Sinai to receive the Torah. And each individual Jew had to internalize the lesson of the Omer, the lesson of the Mon. There's no other way. They had to learn that a Kodesh Bob provides for us. So therefore, even afterwards, when you no longer have a bit, not in your land, and you're separate time and you can't, can't harvest anything, because it, it belongs really to you, because there's no law of, there's, there's no law of bringing offerings outside Eretz Israel and the temple. And you have to go again into the desert of the nations. You've all got a mitzvah to go and count the Omer, because the count of the Omer it goes back before the, before there was a sanctuary and in the desert and before there was also a temple and it carries on when there's no temple and when we're not in the land and therefore the Rabbi Yerucham says every Jew has got the duty to count the days because counting the days as we already described a few of you got this yourselves as well to understand to count the day means to keep on growing day by day. So every day is a new opportunity to grow further, to learn from your mistakes and not to repeat them, and to go face the tests of the new day. Each day has its new challenges, and at each stage to be able to go up one step instead of remaining static, or worse still, going further down. Because if you, the truth is, life is, um, we call it descending escalator in English. In America, we call it descending moving stairs. And we know it's a big sport of children to try to reach the top of descending moving stairs. And really, that's life, what those children try to do. Because if we do nothing, we stagnate, we vegetate. That's what happens to us. But if we face each day as a as a ladder in which you have to go step by step to reach the heights, to fulfill your, the maximum of your potential. And that's the way, day by day, day by day to fill up, day by day getting up, day by day by doing chesed every day, day by day by improving your midot. You have to work day by So that's a mitzvah in Torah. And I say that the halachic aspect of Rabbi Yeruchim who says, quite right, Rabbi Yu, who says, there are two sources. One source is tied to the land, doesn't mention days, that's something different. The one in the Varim is before the end of the land. 
But the one mentioned Emo is a duty of every person. Just like in Emo, a mitzvah of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, which is a duty on each individual. Each individual has to hear the shofar, wherever he is. Not only in the land of Israel, anywhere in the world. He doesn't have to come to Yerushalayim. No, Yerushalayim is something else. Yerushalayim is a special concept when you have your own land. Then you've got to learn centrality of the nation by coming to Yerushalayim three times a year. That's in Pasha's Rei. But in Pasha's Emo, you keep it, every person's got a fast. Although you know this is special. High, the height of Avodah is Avodat Yom Kippurim of the Kohen Gadol, but the Jewish people, they don't go to Yerushalayim on Yom Kippur. No, oh, yeah. no. The most holy days. Roshon Yom Kippur, you, you, you do the service of Hashem at home. Yeah? You look at like today, I don't know, some people have got this idea, I'm almost sure of Nachum Yibraslav in his keva, I know how much he loved Yerushalayim. He would much have preferred everybody celebrates, if it's able to be in Yerushalayim, to celebrate the Shoni Bukhip Yerushalayim. And in fact, there's a, there was a movement in Braslav to move his keva to Eretz Yisrael, which is apparent from his own writings that he would have preferred, instead of remaining in the terrible place of Ukraine, which, is the, which was the area of the Chalmiki massacres, and again also in the time of the Holocaust. But, I mean, you know, We've got an opportunity to be near to the Kotel. He would have preferred also to be buried on Harazetim, to be reburied. And there was a campaign which I was ready to support from one of the Brasilovs to do this. But still, so, <coughs> is we're in a situation that uh, <coughs> there's a lot of money made as a result by the Ukrainians. Yeah, by the going on today. But that's. That's as an aside. But the Iker is, counting the Omer is something which applies all over the world. Because the origin of the Omer is not the offering. That's not the offering which you have to bring after the, on the second day of Pesach. No. It's, it's, it's the, the origin of the Omer is the Mon in the desert. So this is, I think, also the basis for the Rambam. So I'm saying this. The Rambam says today it's a mitzvah in Torah for everybody. He regards it as one mitzvah. There's two parts to it. So one part of it is quite true, it's connected with the Beit HaMikdash. But there's another part which applies universally, wherever the Jew is. It's got to count the Omer. Just like your Kippur applies also for everybody. It's not mentioned in Pasha today. The Pasha A deals with the national. So this is a deep concept. Now, the only question we have to ask, why is it called, why does it say, it's going to be seven complete Shabbatot? Why does it say that in Pasha M? Which implies the counting of the weeks is also Minat Torah. And it's connected with, but it's connected with the offering, it's mentioned together with the offering. So perhaps we can answer like this, that the concept, there's two concepts. One concept is the service of Hashem day by day and to grow through it to the highest level. That's the concept of the seven times seven count days that have to be counted. There's a different concept of the purification of the nation and also even purification of people who are impure where we do find that the, the place from which everyone who becomes impure can become purified, part of it is connected closely with the Beit HaMikdash, namely that purification from being impure with connection with the dead. And today, for example, all of us have too much meat. We will, we will, nearly all of us become impure through connection with the dead. And the, the law is that the only way you can become purified is through the red heifer, Paraduma. It's interesting 
there's so many signs that we're approaching the time of the Mashiach, and one of them is also that in Lakewood there is someone who is carefully looking after the red cow that was born in his farm, and in fact somebody wanted to buy it from him, he wouldn't sell it for a million dollars. He's looking after it day after day in different ways to make sure that all the laws concerning the red heifer will become fulfilled. They can only become fulfilled if there's a Beit HaMikdash or near a Beit HaMikdash. And then one can fulfill it and one can perhaps reach a level when Jewish people will be pure enough to return to the service of the Beit HaMikdash. So we see Tuma and Tara is closely connected throughout the Chumash as I'm sure you realize, any of you who've even read through the Chumash superficially, that we hope we'll be able to come to that level of Tara. So that level of Tara you can't reach in America. You want to stay there all the time. Or not even, not even in Stamford Hill in London, you can't reach that Tuma, that, that Tara from that Tuma. In other words, real Tara at the ultimate level can only come with Ikaula, with the redemption in Eretz Israel. Now, this is a concept which has to do with the national center of Am Yisrael. The national center of Am Yisrael is Eretz Israel, and at the highest level is Yerushalayim and the Harabait. So this is closely connected with the concept of the weak. Why? Because the, the, the whole concept that the foundation of Am Yisrael came through, through the, the seven Ushpizim, the seven great leaders of Am Yisrael, Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and uh, Moshe and Aaron, and Yosef al and David Amelach. And all this follows, as you know, the seven Midot. There are seven basic qualities which we find attached to these great personalities. Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. This is the power of Chesed, Gevura, and Tif Eret. And Moshe, and Aaron, and Netzach, and Hod. Yosef, and Tzadik is Yisod, and Malchut is David, and So these are the seven, both the seven basic, deeper moral qualities which have to enter into the lifestyle of the people of Israel. And the, the national leaders are these that we've mentioned. These are also the ways in which Hashem's great spiritual power enters into the life of mankind through the people of Israel. So this is the concept of the weak. And it goes much deeper because uh, the, 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 the entry of an animal to be is fit for sacrifice is first got to be seven days and then the eighth day can be sacrificed. Also, the level of the Kohen Gadol, that was the highest level of the Beit HaMikdash, is, the, is eight. Is going into not just the way in which Hashem reveals Himself in nature, but to reach a supernatural level. It's therefore the Kedusha of the Beit HaMikdash, its highest level, is connected with number eight. The way in which a Gentile can become a Jew and the way in which, in fact, you'll put it better, the way in which a person is born to a Jewish mother can really enter into the Jewish nation is through the Brit Mila. And it says explicitly in the 17th chapter of Bereshit, where Avram Avinu was given the mitzvah of Mila, together with the mitzvah of Mila was given Eretz Israel. But Eretz Israel has got a supernatural aspect to it which comes by Am Yisrael working hard to recognize the power of Hashem in nature, the seven days, and the eighth day represents the level of the highest redemption of Am Yisrael in the service of the Beit HaMikdash. That's why the sages also say the eight dimension is the dimension of the coming of the Mashiach, and the seven is the dimension we can reach in all the more natural events of history, to recognize the power of Hashem in nature. And really, this goes together with the Hebrew language, which is often an indication of psychological and philosophical basis of reality. 
So the number Sheva is also the root, the verbal root is in fact Shavua, to make an oath. Really, people often ask, what's the difference if a person makes an oath or he promises? What's the difference between making a promise and making an oath? Any difference? Promise towards huh? man, Shavua towards Hashem. Yeah, because the Shavua means bringing Hashem into it. And this, we know that originally the, the faith of mankind, Adam and Ishan, he knew that Hashem existed. So Shavua originally was a reference, I, I, take, I say by the name of Hashem that this is true. Now, in the Gentile world, you also find their oaths are, many of them, are distortions of Hashem. Uh, they became idolaters, and therefore, they, by them, the difference was they made an oath by their God. They knew there was a supernatural power. Only their supernatural power, they, they either thought it was the sun or the moon, or it was the tree, or it was some other form of animation. They said, this is my God, or these are my gods. So this, this is just a distortion of the original entry of the power of Hashem into the world of nature. And really it goes back to the, what is declared today by thousands of scientists. They say science proves the existence of God. How does it prove it? Through this through principle of harmony. And the whole concept of seven is the one of harmony. There is a, a non-phenomenological, a non-empirical, it's called non-empirical aspect to all the phenomena that exist. All areas of nature, when you start studying more deeply, they go back to energy, and energy goes back to a non-material energy. As one of the popular, some of the greatest, greatest philosopher of science used to say that modern science has demonstrated the concrete world has gone through the science, has, has slipped through the scientific net. And all that we see is a spiritual essence, which is the basis of the material universe. So, as another one says, the science tries to read the mind of God, the Creator. And it's hard, that was Einstein's definition of God, he also looks at it. God is the principle of harmony which you find in discovering all areas of nature. And the concept of Sheva is the harmony principle of all the different, is the concept of the six states which are external aspects of nature, the different grades of nature, which however, Shabbat Fash, they all demonstrate that behind everything is the soul power of Hashem. So that's the concept of the seven. The eight is going beyond it. Being able, let's say, the human nature which, which has its aspect also in the reproductory the limbs that we possess, which give the possibility the human race to be creative and to be procreative. This is something which we subject to the covenant with Hashem, the Brit. The sign of the Brit is the eight. The Hashem is a supernatural power, even above nature, and can change nature. When a person says, I've got to do what comes naturally, so we as Jews say, no, we, have, we can control our nature because we've got inside ourselves a holy neshama, which is the breath of God. That's the eighth dimension. So therefore, when we come to Shavuot, also the same thing. Tismul Hamishim Yom, after seven times seven, we reach the eighth level with the giving of the Torah. And the Torah is always defined as the eighth level. It comes out most prominently in the 190th chapter of Tehillim. What is that? Then do you know? 109th chapter, the longest chapter in Tehillim? 19, 119. Pardon? 119. 119. Alphabeta. Yeah, how many verses? Uh, 22 times 8. Which is how much? Which is 20 times 8. 172. Uh, 176. 6, 8. 8. Yeah. So that 22 times times 8, and in fact that chapter is called Tamya Apya because 
every aspect of Torah. It begins with the words, Ashrei Tmimei Derech, Haholchem Batorah Happy are those whose path is one of Tamimot. That means it's a path that leads to perfection. It does not mean that they're actually completely perfect, but they're on the path of path of perfection. So the Torah is the pattern that leads human beings on the path of perfection, which is you go up the ladder on the seven times seven and reach the eighth level given in the Torah. And just like you find in chapter 19 of Tehillim, which is the heavens declare the glory of Hashem, the first seven verses describe the harmony of God shown in nature of the universe, and the eighth verse begins with Torah Tash Torah Tashayyam Tamima Torah Tashayyam Tamima Torah Tashayyam Tamima Mercy was no flesh. The perfect Torah, what does it do? It brings back the soul of the universe to Amiswal who keep the Torah. It's the time that revives the Nefesh. It tells you you've got a divine soul, which is the eighth level, which is even higher than the harmony of ordinary nature. It is reaching a level of supernature. It's from Ashim All this leads us to understand this Pasuk, you find it is mentioned at the beginning, before we go and count the Omer, we use the Pasuk. There should be Sheva Shabbatot Tamimot The seven Shabbatot are all ways to reach a high level of perfection. In other words, the concept of the Shabbat is that we've got to recognize the way to reach the soul is to improve the seven Midot in our lives. For those seven Midot, which we described before briefly, each day you should reach a higher and a higher level. And as you'll find, so this is closely connected with what you find in the in the Siddur, where if you look carefully, the first day it says at the end, Chesed Shebe Chesed. The starting point is the highest level of loving kindness as demonstrated by Ramavin. Then you have, in Chesed you have seven levels. Gavura. Chesed means constantly doing loving kindness, recognizing that that is the basis of changing yourself. Because you can only change yourself if you're willing to recognize you, you are put in this world, world of mankind, to help others. Because Hashem has put you in this world, He's given you everything. Therefore, you can only reach Hashem if you also keep giving. That's why the emphasis in the whole life of Ramavino is to keep giving. He was even willing to have a shidduch for his son from a family that had left belief in one God, who were idolaters, and they lived amongst idolaters. But if you saw in them chesed, you saw here there's a girl who would do anything to help other people, to help a wayfarer, comes with strangers and comes with animals, has nothing to drink. Chesed shiba chesed. And even when he, when he had a brief Mila and he was in pain, he did not give up, standing even in the heat of the day outside in order to see if there's any stranger who needs to have a bit of a rest in a tent and be able to have food and drink in that tent. So this is an even when there was an anti chesed society in Saddam who didn't allow any loving kindness and therefore Hashem thought, well, they are the exact opposite of Abraham Avinu, but before I remove them from life in this, in the one of the most luxurious areas, I must see what Avram has to say. Because after all, they are the ones who are the antithesis of his life. And Avram said, well, you've got to see, maybe there's a few innocent people. You can't destroy them. So 
it shows how far his chesed went. So that's, that's the beginning of the counting. And then we count seven different grades of chesed. Let's count the power of Gavura. Gavura means you've also got to have, with your chesed, you sometimes need strong Gavura. If you're constantly doing chesed, you might be too tolerant. That's how, as is happening today. There are many Jews who are very, very big Pali Chesed. And they say, well, you know, the suicide bombers, we have to be kind to them. And even if they want to continue murdering innocent people, well, you, know, you can't, you can You can only, only change them through kindness. And therefore we have the situation of the revolving pri prisons. And the prisoners who know for sure that there's no capital punishment, and therefore they can start finding ways of deceiving others that they're no longer murderers, or even to come out with that intention still even being publicized, will just be more cruel. So, you know, you've got to have kavura sometimes to recognize if somebody comes to kill you, or to kill many innocent people, then it's your duty sometimes to disarm them, to wound them, that's not enough, somebody's got to kill them. It's self-defense. So therefore there's a limit also to tolerating evil in this world. Therefore part of the commandment, so you've got Ivatara Mikebecha, you have to destroy evil and not allow through the principle of very kindly universal tolerance to um, <coughs> show the other cheek when somebody hits you on, on one cheek and not resist any form of violence by resisting physically. So this is not, not the way of Shashem demands from us. So we, also, we have to learn Gavura also, just like Hashem. And so we go, all not, not describing now each middle, not that time, all these middle go on until on the last day it's Malchut Shema Malchut. David HaMelech represents recognizing Hashem as King and uh, to recognize the ultimate kingship of Hashem in our lives. As we say also in Aleinu, we look forward to the time. We look forward to the time when Hashem will remove. It doesn't say to destroy all the wicked. He should turn all the wicked to do teshuva and come back to you. And therefore, that's what we have to work on today. Make all Am Yisrael and through Am Yisrael the rest of the world into a valley to Shuvah, we've got to do our part, and that might bring the Malchut. So I'll just, I'll just share with you what I mentioned briefly yesterday, so I'll mention it now to everybody, <clears throat> that when you think that, uh, you know, there's a Ya'ir <coughs> Lapid, means let, the Lapid is a flame, it says by the giving of the Torah, the people saw the flames that were burning at the time when the Torah was given. So it came as a shock, but it was a, through this shock they woke up. They trembled, the mountain trembled, but they woke up. They woke up to listen to the voice of Hashem, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. So there, Ya'ir Lapid, Ya'ir means let the flame shine with light. That's the Lapid. His father, Tommy Lapid, was a Holocaust survivor. And uh, he turned his head. And to some extent, you know, it says already in, in the Pasha, you become a sugar from the persecution that you go through. And there's no question, hundreds of thousands of Jews came completely with sugar. They became insane. And sometimes even if you, if you go and read a lot of Holocaust stories, it can drive you crazy to think and to imagine what those people went through. And uh, the people as a result says, I can't believe anymore. To some extent, not their fault. They, they, they were in such a terrible situation, it was impossible for them to believe anymore. Hashem was looking after them. Although there were great saints who were able to do it, 
for that is to be a very great saint. And even the big saints recognized it. The saints have survived. And the, the, the Hasidim wanted to be with them. And they said, when the, when the Rebbe came to visit them, then he went away. When he went away, they asked the Rebbe, no, to whom should we go for a blessing now? Because uh, they wanted the blessing of the Rebbe. So he said to them, many more than one Rebbe, said to the Hasidim, you don't need to look far. Go into any shul and see when a, there's a person who's putting on his arm to fill in, and you see a number on his arm, that's the greatest Rebbe we have today. If someone has been through that, hell, and he comes out as a believer, and even comes to shul to put on to fill in, he's a much greater saint than I'll ever be. That's the greatest saint, get a blessing from him. So when you've been through such situations, we are not, we must, we melam it's good. That, well, so, he, he, he found a place in the government, but I'll tell you what his good is. He was very much against Christian missionaries, because he recognized that the Holocaust was partly influenced by leaders of Christianity. Oh. There were far and few in between who helped the Jews. Yeah. And there, there were others who tried to force the Jews to become baptized and use cruel methods. And there, were, there was, there was, I mean, as we weren't going to have a question of what the Pope did, but it certainly <coughs> it didn't do enough. And there were some of them very cruel. So he became very anti Christian missionaries. <coughs> and therefore I say, <coughs> I would ask somebody to start, start pulling the ropes that there's due to be a four-day convention of the, all the leaders from the whole world of the J4J movement, which the movement is trying hard to get Jews to come to Christianity. <coughs> you know, they, they say you can still keep the mitzvot. Oh. Yeah, keep the mitzvot like... <coughs> like the Son of God did. He also kept the mitzvot. So you also keep the mitzvot, but you've got to serve him. You've got to know he's the Son of God. I'd rather serve God. What? I'd rather serve God than the Son. I am a Son of God, so we're on the same level. Why would I serve You're God? right, you're right. How would I serve somebody else? Okay, I'm not saying... I'm, I'm saying we must... <coughs> I hope that Ya'il Lapid because he's following, trying to be more light to what his, what his father tried to do, didn't achieve, <coughs> to banish the, <coughs> the Haredi influence. He didn't achieve it. And he's trying to do it. Okay, let him do something which his father would approve of. To go and stop this missionary four-day convention, which is also taking place on Shavuot. For, before, for four days. And they've rented a hall which is under the supervision of the municipality. <coughs> Jerusalem. Jerusalem. There's a big battle going on. And uh, the Supreme Court has given the permission. So we have to work against it. Maybe our thriller is, the Elapid will help to abolish it. And on the contrary, that all these Jews, <coughs> they'll join. <coughs> invited to join learning sessions, mm. <coughs> many different <coughs> teshuva groups and organizations <coughs> as a result, <coughs> they recognize <coughs> that um, <coughs> no such thing. We are, that all Am in fact the whole world, are all called children of God. We're all children of God. <coughs> And therefore, all children of God can turn to God directly. <coughs> so thereby, we reach Yitzhak Hashem, the 50th level, and maybe even the time when Kablu Kulam at Olmachutecha Bamalchut Shibamalchut.